How many is the 23rd Psalm one of your favorite chapters of the entire Bible? Yeah. Amen? Awesome chapter. And I, first of all, I'm going to start at the very beginning, if you don't mind, and just, just so I can go through a little bit how great this really is. The Lord is my shepherd. Most of us don't know anything about being shepherds. But I will tell you that when you're a shepherd, uh, that you take care of your sheep. And the Lord picture, at this, obviously David was a shepherd. There's a lot of work involved with shepherds. Shepherds have to protect the flock from uh, bears and lions and all types of evil things. And he says, I shall not want because the Lord is my shepherd. And it says, he makes me lie down in green pastures, not pastures that are dry, not pastures that are dying, but he leads us to green pastures. Why? Because sheep need green pastures. And then he says this, he leads me beside the still waters. You know, sheep are terrified animals. I don't, I don't know if you all know this. I did a bunch of research on this this week. Do you know that sheep will be so scared sometimes that they cannot have anybody do anything from them? They'll just sit and scream. And I, I never knew this till this week. And But if the shepherd comes, the shepherd will bring peace to that lamb. But if you go to that little lamb, the lamb will be freaking out. The lamb can be tied up in a fence. You won't be able to help it. The neighbor won't be able to help it. Nobody else will. But when the shepherd comes, he can set that lamb free. I thought that was really good. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I know many of us have been there. I will feel no fear no evil. I've experienced that personally. You are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And this is what I want to deal with. And waited all week. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Oh my. And you anoint my head with oil and my cup runs over. What I want you to notice here with this scripture is is that it says here, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Is that not unbelievable? Think about what this says. All week I was like, that is how you do things. That is totally unbelievable. <laughs> if you look at Joseph, he had a table prepared from the presence of his wicked brothers. Do you remember that? And then if you go on in time, he prepared a table that ate the lamb during the days of Moses. What I'm trying to tell you this morning, God wants you to know somebody in here has been done wrong. Someone, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's for somebody online. I have no clue. But what I'm trying to say is that you've been done wrong. They never repented. You think God ain't going to do a thing about it. And what God says, those enemies are put in your life. So that in your presence, I'm going to prepare a table for them and prove to them how wrong they actually were. How wrong they were. A lot of people serve God and everybody around them says, you're crazy. You're a nut farm. What's it about this Jesus? Well, I believe in God too. But they don't say put God down at number 10 instead of number 1. But you're an idiot for putting God first. God says, oh no. I'm going to prepare a table before thee in the presence of my enemies. Let me tell you what this means. Do you remember when Samson was taken captive? And what they did with Samson, they chained him up to the pillars. And what they did, they had a banquet. And they ate while their enemy was chained up. This was a common practice done during that day. And what he, all the tribes of all the world that would get in fights and battles, they would take the prisoners captive, they would chain them to pillars, and they would eat a feast and show them the feast you don't get to eat because you didn't surrender. I'm not making that up. That was part, and Jesus, whether you like it or not, says, I prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Is that not what he says? So he says, that's what's going to happen. These people that laughed at you, these people made fun of you, these people that hurt you, molested you, raped you, treated you awful, if they don't repent, they will find out one day that God has prepared a table for you and they're going to watch you eat at that table and get ready and he's going to anoint your head with oil. Now, why is he going to do this? It's when you are a sheep, you fight battles. And do you know when you're a sheep, a bear or a lion will come up and attack you and latch his claws into the side of your leg. 
side of your side here, top of your head. That's why it was such a big deal is the sheep always had scars and cuts and scratches all over their head. And what's he going to do? He's going to anoint your head with that oil. And so while you are being fixed up in all your wounds of this life, trying to get through this, trying to follow Christ, trying to do what's right, he's going to anoint your head in oil in the presence of your enemies. Listen to this. It says this, that the devil and his angels will be tormented in who? In the presence of the Lamb. <laughs> That's what it says. That's what it says. So when you think that God ain't doing something, you think that God has never repercussed these people that have treated you horrible, raped you, molested you, stole from you, ruined your life, you lost your home, you lost your car, all because of somebody else. They never repented. They're laughing, wiping their mouth like nothing's <coughs> ever went wrong. God said, oh, I ain't forgot that. I ain't forgot that. Because one day, I'm going to prepare you a table. And your enemies are going to watch you eat it in my presence at my table. Oh my, that should be shouting stuff right there. Now, we are not vengeful type people. That's why God says, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. You don't have to do a thing. And let me explain something to you too. <laughs> seeing you seeing this, that's why Jesus says, I say unto you, pray for those that use you. Pray for you, those that abuse you. Pray for those that steal from you. You know why? Because of this. He's going to make a table. You're going to be eating at it. And if they don't repent, this is what's going to happen. You see what I mean? That's why you need to pray for them. There was a guy one time that <laughs> so the, a woman had came to my house and gave her life to Jesus Christ. Okay, So what this guy thought he'd do is he would subvert what I did. Now I'm not making this up. You, I know you're thinking they ain't nobody that dumb. Yeah, they are. There's people that's dumb. You can't be saved. And God don't mean for you to live like this. And God don't care what you do. And don't matter what you do, it's not a sin. And he completely caused her to fall from God. She wasn't saved one day. Had repented one day full of joy and met to the devil. <laughs> so I get a phone call. This person at 6 o'clock in the morning on Sunday of all days decided to call me and tell me a piece of his mind and how he'd straighten this girl out. Now, whether you believe this or not, don't care. The Holy Ghost fell all over me and I started preaching on the phone. And I said, it is better that you should have hung a stone around your neck and threw yourself in the still water than what you've done today. Next thing you know, I turn around and start praying. And... and Everybody's like, why are you praying for this guy? This, what he's done is awful. I said, because I know the punishment that is going to fall upon him for this sin. And it did. It has not ended. It has never ended. It will never end. He will not repent. He, he's one of these people, I don't know if you ever met him, that it doesn't matter what Jesus said, they do their own thing. They, they have their own God, their own law, their own everything. And, it, and it's bad because they twist in the scriptures to meet their own lusts. Anything they want to do, they justify. If they commit adultery, they justify it. Oh, Jesus don't care about it. He does care about this. And this is what he did. And he's not happy being a pervert himself. He perverts everyone around him. Everybody he meets. And so somebody gets their life right with Christ. And I want to tell you, I can't believe the stuff that's costing me. It's cost him his children. It's cost him two wives. It's cost him all. He, nothing stays together. It falls apart constantly because he attacked a child of God. I tell you, he does prepare a table for, for you in the presence of your enemies. He, When the enemy and the lions and the, the dogs of the earth have attacked you, stretched you to pieces, he's going to anoint yourself with oil. And here's the one thing he wanted me to deal with today is my cup runneth over. Now, what you may not understand what this means is, and I, I had to do some heavy research to figure this out, but if you go to be in somebody's house and they don't really like you, or they're just you're just a common guest, I don't know if you ever noticed this, that they always pour a little bit in, in your glass. You ever notice that? Okay? They'll pour a little bit in your glass. Okay? And this was common throughout all history. And a lot of people, especially drinking wine, they only want it about half full so they can scent, smell the aroma. You ever notice that? Okay. <laughs> That's what it says here. While you're in the presence of your enemies, he's going to anoint your head with oil. He's going to prepare you a table. and He's going to fill that cup till it runs over. Now what that means, all that shopping stuff right there, what that means is I have got great 
favor. This ain't just somebody visiting. This is somebody that lives in my house. Okay, the Japanese do this. I had to do a bunch of research to figure out what this was talking about. Did you know that when I never drank sake? And I don't care if you have, it's not going to offend me. But what I'm telling you is I've just not drank it. I drank all kinds of liquor, especially in sinful days. But I just never had sake. But the Japanese do this. When you get sake, they'll put it in a box. And they'll pour that sake on that and it will run because it's too full. It's full. Do you not know that the Japanese say that's because we want you to know how much you mean to us. That's why when you go to a Japanese restaurant, that sake is there. It's sitting in a, excuse me there, and it's sitting in its little thing, and it fills up down here in this bottom. It's overflowing. That means you're important to me. That means you're extremely important to me. Is that not shouting stuff right there? You ain't going to get a half glass. Here in the world, we try to get a little bit, just a little bit, just a little bit. You fight, you fight, you fight. They don't get anything. We gave up. Because we don't want the world. Jesus says, don't worry about it. I want to fill that glass till it's running over. It is running over, church. That is awesomeness. And he says, this surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Not just the one hereafter. This life too. This life too. <laughs> so your cup will run over because you love Jesus. And this week gave me a totally new excitement for the Lord because I thought, gosh, he loves us so much. Even though he wants us to forgive other people, there's a reason for the vengeance. Because he's going to show them, I have favor with them. See, you don't want less than them. You don't want them to tell, you don't want to hear them say that God needs to be first. You put God first, you look like an idiot. Because you put God first. That, you look stupid to the world. You're surrounded by enemies. Surrounded. But I tell you right now, there'll be a day he's going to prepare a table for his enemies. Amen? Amen? Amen. So, you know, people do awful things to us in life, and you think God don't care. Oh, he cares. He wants them to repent. He wants them to repent, but if they don't, oh my. Oh my. The bank which you don't get to go to because you didn't want the son. Because you didn't want to love. See, you, we love and we get ripped to pieces as lamb, don't we? The lamb, we get shredded. How many's got scars? I've got scars everywhere. I've got them in my mind. I've got them on my back. Back. It's all you ever know. I don't know what it is, but in my, and spiritually, I feel it's my back. They've shredded my back, but he's going to anoint my head with oil. He's going to patch up all that pain and suffering and all that misery, all the betrayals, everything that ever happened. And those that did not repent, those that did not say they were sorry for the things they did to you, woe unto them. Woe. Good Lord, woe. God help you is what that means. God help you. And we don't take up that vengeance, but it gives God pleasure. <laughs> Hear what he says. Gives me pleasure to punish those that do, that, now you don't believe that's true. Let's look at James. Let's look at James. Herod meets Jesus. He couldn't wait to meet Jesus. First of all, Herod gets himself in trouble because he decided to his brother was a king and a great, I can't remember where he was from. Forgive me, it slips me now. I'll think of it later. But anyway, he was another king and Herod wanted his wife. So Herod wanted his brother's wife. Well, so did she. She thought, oh yeah, he's a big king. See, the way I understand it, it's the history I studied, is he had more money. And he had more power and he had more glory. So she's like, oh well, if I stay with him, I'll just take over with him. So she takes over with him. John the Baptist shows up. Hey, what you're doing, God don't like. Okay, now you need to send your brother's wife back home. And so she hated John the Baptist. And Herod then obviously had problems, but this cause of Herodias. Herodias, she wanted the power. So that's how John the Baptist's head got cut off. is because he tried to please Herodias' daughter. Who, think about the level of wickedness. That's not Herod's daughter. That's his brother's daughter. <laughs> you, you can't even make this stuff up. So you think, well, he got by with that. And then he, he has John the Baptist's head cut off. And you think Herodias got by with that because she wanted it on, well, his daughter did, on a plate. 
Who can imagine sitting at a banquet? So they're feasting. They're cutting off John the Baptist's heads. They're putting it on a charger. He comes in. He makes fun of Jesus. They're raising him in a row. Makes fun of him. Oh, no big deal, right? Everything's just went fine and dandy. No doubt the, Christian, the believers of the day were saying, isn't God going to do anything? Isn't God going to work this out? Is he not going to do one single thing after seeing all these things happen? Oh, yeah, he is. He's going to give them time to repent. Remember, he's slow to judge and to move his hand he gives you time to repent so he gives Harry time to repent Harry doesn't repent then along comes James and he takes James up and he kills James the brother of Jesus and the apostle that wrote the book of James and then one day he stands up God waits patiently even then killed my own brother and you, you've done all these horrible things but he stands up one day and he says is this not my great kingdom that by my power and my might I've created and God said I've had enough in the presence of all of them they witnessed that his bowels gushed open and words come gushing out of his body and he died instantly. See, God's judgment is prolonged, but it does come. So yeah, a John the Baptist family is probably flipping out, when is judgment going to fall for these? Does, does it not say in Revelation? Are we not reading Revelation? What's it say? That the souls of those who were slain for the word of God cry out to God day and night. When are you going to avenge our blood on them that killed us? We don't understand who Jesus is. We think that Jesus lets anything go on. We think Jesus don't have our back. Jesus don't care what we suffered. Jesus don't care what I went through. That's a lie. He does care. He's given them time to repent. But if they don't repent, bad things, 70 A.D., Give you a prime example. They didn't know the hour of his coming. Jesus stands up on the mountain and he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I would have gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would not I'll leave you desolate. And he's crying. He's crying because he knows the judgment's going to fall on them <coughs> because he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. So he gives them 40 years, not even quite 40, but they have a total of 70 years approximately to repent from the preaching of John the Baptist and Jesus then the apostles he gives them time to repent they don't repent so in 67 AD they gather around Jerusalem and for three and a half years or 42 months they starve the children of Israel to death and Jesus says when you see it coming you get out of there because where you see the eagles gathered together, the Roman legion's emblem, there you'll find the carcasses. And do you know that the historian Josephus said the entire city of Jerusalem went insane? Because Jesus said, I say unto you that when evil spirit leaves a man, he will go walk through dry places. When he can't find a place to rest, well, he will go back to the house he came out of and take with him seven more devils worse than himself and the last state is worse than the first and so it shall be with this generation. So when they crucified Jesus and God said it is finished, the time is up. They have not repented. It's been seven years. It's finished. He withdrew everything to do with God and devils flooded Jerusalem. Study your history and you'll find that's a fact. That's a fact. So what I'm telling you is you need to pray for your enemies. Pray for those people who use you and have abused you. Pray for those people that's raped and molested you. Pray for them because I say unto you, judgment will fall. It will fall. That's why I want you to pray for them. 